<clears throat> There's a little bit of trouble with Comcast this morning. No, it's CenturyLink. CenturyLink. They're all the same to me. <laughs> trouble. The more technology we have, the easier our life gets, right? <laughs> um, so we're just going to be recording and putting it on later for now. Um, and I guess we'll start once Dave gives me the we're recording yeah, cue. We're on. we're on. Okay. If you would please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. We're going to continue our study on the Holy Spirit of God from Wednesday night. Um, title of this lesson, I want to continue with the same thought. I didn't quite get where I wanted to go with it. Um, there's just a lot in the Bible on the Holy Spirit. Um, but the title of my lesson this morning is called The Most Dangerous Member of the Trinity. The Most Dangerous Member of the Trinity. Um, and you'll see why by the time we're done with the lesson this morning. Um, but in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, starting in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the many blessings you've given us in our lives. Lord, I just i am very thankful every day that you give me. And I know that those in our church that are here this morning feel the same way. Lord, I ask now that it would be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> there's a few things. The reason why I started with these first, these first three verses is there's a lot of information here explaining, number one, one of the things I jotted down was this, that nobody's saved by saying Jesus Christ is accursed. They have to know who Jesus is. Nobody ever got saved not knowing how they got saved. You know, you either know who he is or you don't. Um, you can't just say, you know, I believe in Jesus or I believe in God, and that's going to get you through the doors of heaven. Uh, we're going to show that this morning. But, you know, it's funny because the word accursed or accursed, it actually comes, accursed comes from the word accursed. And I, I jotted down that it's a verb, it's to put on, put a curse on or to curse that person. And I thought that that was kind of ironic going along with thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. You know, what the, like the number one cuss word that you hear all the time now is Jesus Christ, right? I mean, you just, everything you turn on, every person... It's this, it's that, it's just so derogatory. And it's, it's, I'm not saying everybody who takes the name of the Lord in vain is going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is ironically, ironically, the world in general curses the Lord Jesus Christ. Ironically. But the word we're looking at is accursed. And that's actually an adjective. That is a word used to describe a person, place, or thing, an adjective. So what you're describing Jesus Christ is, is you're describing him as a curse. You're basically saying he's under a curse, used to express strong dislike or of anger towards someone or something. So what you're doing by saying Jesus Christ is a curse, you could just be saying Jesus Christ is not God. Right. You could just be saying Jesus Christ is still in the tomb. Right. Because the Bible says is cursed is every man that hangs or everyone that hangs upon the tree. What you could be saying is, I don't believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. I don't believe he's God at all. And there's many religions out there today, and we've gone over each one of them, and we know that there are many religions, they have a Jesus, right? Or they claim to say Jesus isn't a bad guy, or, you know, he had a great message, but he's still in the grave. He's a great guy and all, but he's a lesser God. He's a great guy and all, he did many good things, but he's not part of the Trinity because we don't believe in a Trinity. 
See, what they're saying and the danger in saying things about who Jesus Christ really is, the danger you run into is you're denying salvation because salvation is supplied by God, right? We have read that the other day. God is our Savior. We read that in Who is the King of Glory. We know that God's our Savior. What you're doing is you're basically saying Jesus isn't the Savior. That's what you're saying. By saying Jesus Christ is accursed or Jesus is accursed, you're basically saying, I don't believe he's my savior. That's what you're saying. And now it gets kind of tricky in the wording because Jehovah's Witness, they'll call Jesus the savior or sacrifice. They'll actually say he actually came and was the sacrifice. But they deny the fact that he's God. Now, here's the funny thing. The verse continues to say, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord. See, you can call him accursed, but you can't call him the Lord at the same time. And that's what many of the false religions do. They'll say things like, well, I believe in Jesus. I just don't believe he's the Lord. I don't believe he's God. I don't believe he's part of the Trinity. I believe he's a lesser God or someone lower than God Almighty. Now, We've read other verses that say Jesus uh, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Well, he's equal with God. That makes him God, right? I'm not equal with God. Even though I'm a son of God, the Bible says, but to as many as received him, to them, them gave he power to be called the sons of God, even to them that believe upon his name or his power. Okay, the power of Jesus, right? So here's what we got to remember. We're sons of God, but we're not God. When you go to heaven, you're not going to be a God. I hate to burst your bubble. You're not going to be a God. And there are religions that actually teach these things. Mormonism is one of them. That when you die and you make it to one of their heavens or one of their new earths or whatever it is, they got like seven or eight of them, and you're going to have babies in the afterlife, and you're you're going to jump around on planets, and you're going to be a God. Well, that's not true because there's only one God, right? And you're not it. Although we tend to make ourselves a God. And that's why it's hard to submit to the only true God of the Bible. But see, here's the other thing. There's only one way that God reveals himself to you. There's only one way that you, as the saved believer today, understand who Jesus is. You may not be able to explain the Trinity. Boy, it's a hard thing to explain. It's hard to put it into our uh, modern vernacular or our terminology. How do we explain a three-in-one God, right? It's really hard. You can bend the brain. But I tell you this, I don't believe God wants you to understand everything about him yet. See, the glass is still dark, Even though we've got a lot of revelation of God and who he is and what he expects from us, things are still a little bit foggy. Oh, every day that goes by, we can see a little more prophecy. We can see God work among the nations a little bit differently. We can see God working. We can see the Holy Spirit working. But our full grasp of who God is, it's we don't know it yet. Okay, because we've never met God the Father and we've never seen with our eyes, Jesus Christ, although we see him because we know him because we're saved, right? We know who Jesus is according to the pages of the Bible. We know there's a Holy Spirit of God, but try explaining it to people. It's hard, right? You know why? Because they don't understand it because the Holy Ghost isn't speaking to them. The reason why you're saved, the reason why you understand Jesus is God is for the last part of this verse. But, but, by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost talked to your heart one day and the Holy Ghost revealed to you who Jesus was, the Son of God, right? And you received him as your personal Savior. You accepted Jesus Christ and guess what? He accepted you where you are, a sinner. But God who commendeth his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He already knew what he had to do. But it's the Holy Spirit of God that reveals who Jesus is, reveals he's risen, reveals he died on a cross, reveals that it's not his spirit in heaven, which there are religions that believe that, but it's actually his resurrected, first begotten body of the dead. See, if Jesus Christ wasn't physically resurrected from the dead, then we'd have no real hope. 
We couldn't believe in a rapture. Why? Because the rapture is a physical resurrection or a physical transformation, right? We're being translated. When we're raptured out of here, we'll be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, right? So it's important to understand that what we believe is a very sound doctrine on who God is. And it explains a lot, and it will help you in your Bible reading, is understanding who Jesus Christ actually is. And it's his bodily resurrection that saves us. Not just his death, not just the shedding of the blood, it's all of it. It's him in the ground for three days. It's the devil not being able to keep his soul in hell, nor suffering the Holy One to see corruption, according to David. It's all these things wrapped into one that explains to you through, or is explained to you through the Holy Ghost who Jesus Christ is. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people running around professing to say they know Jesus Christ, but yet they break every doctrine in the Bible to try to show you their religion's right. And I could go through all that, and maybe I'll do a study on each individual religion just to show you what they actually believe and then show you where they contradict the Bible, Old and New Testament. You'll see one of those today, Seventh Day of Venice, because they believe in keeping the Sabbath. Now, the Holy Ghost didn't tell them that. The Holy Ghost, according to the Word of God, did not say that you could keep one law at one time to get saved. Why? Because none of us can Nobody ever kept the law, not for one second. Do you think when I woke up this morning that I kept the law for 10 minutes? No. Do you think I possibly could? Oh, there's some of them I could, but not all of them. Why? Because I can get up and I can covet something just like that. Oh, I wish I had this. I wish I had that. Instead of being thankful for what I do have, right? I can say, I wish that... You know, this person did what I wanted them to do. And I start to go off in making myself a God or putting another God before God. I can get carried away that quick. Why? Because I'm a human being and I can't keep the law. But the law wasn't there for us to keep to get to heaven. Now it's there to keep to get a blessing. I'll tell you this right now. You try to keep the law and God's going to have his blessing upon your life. You'll see that this morning. Obeying God. Look, you can never go wrong obeying the word of God. Never. Right? I mean, you, I can show you people in the Bible that when they obeyed the word of God, God worked great in their life. I can also show you guys that the minute they quit obeying God, everything fell apart. Their families fell apart. Their lives fell apart. They lost the kingdom. Their grandparents or, or their grandkids get carried away into other countries and they're made eunuchs. I mean, when you don't obey God, there's consequences for our disobedience, right? But we are taught by the Holy Spirit of God. So the first one thing, I only really have one point this morning. The Holy Ghost speaks, you should listen. When the Holy Ghost speaks, you should listen. It's funny because as I was writing this, I, I, this, it's funny how commercials pop in your mind. I don't watch television and haven't for years, okay? I haven't for years. And at times I hadn't watched it for a decade or so. But I can remember being a teenager and I can remember watching TV and a commercial would come on. And it's the dumbest things that stick in your brain, right? And if you can remember this, they would say, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen, right? Do you remember that? Somebody would bring up E.F. Hutton and the whole place would go quiet and they'd go. And it would be like, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. But how much more so when the Holy Spirit talks, we should listen, right? That's the most important person to talk to you is the Holy Spirit of God. But isn't it funny how we can remember these silly little things and apply them to our lives? I mean, that was just some dumb commercial, but yet it had a valid point. And the point is, when the Holy Ghost speaks, you should listen. It's just like the Allstate commercial. You're in good hands with Allstate. Hey, you're in better hands if you're in Jesus Christ's hands, right? I mean, look, I'm not saying don't have insurance because you believe God's going to protect you from every little thing. I'm saying... Put yourself in his capable hands. When the Holy Ghost speaks, that's who you should listen to, not some financial advisor, right? You should listen to the Holy Spirit of God. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter number 2.
Hebrews chapter number 2. Now, Wednesday night, I was a little bit in Hebrews chapter number 1. You know, I brought up a few things out of verse number 5. The Bible reads in Hebrews 1, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Those words that appear to be archaic are actually really important words because if you trace the word begotten through the book of Acts, uh, through John 3.16 and into Revelation chapter 1, I believe it's verse 8, Jesus the first begotten from the dead, that is a very, very important doctrine. Jesus isn't God's one and only son. Why? Because we're all considered sons once we get saved. But to as many as received him, to them gave you power to be called the sons of God. So when you're saved, you become a son of God. So many translations now of the word of God booger and destroy doctrine and basically call Jesus Christ accursed because he's begotten. And that it comes from the word begat, which means to bring forth, right? Jesus is the first begotten. He's the first one that's brought forth from the dead. And I think I brought this up Wednesday night. There are many people like Lazarus, the widow's son that came back to life, but they were still in their corrupt body. They died again, right? They died again and they're still on this earth. Their body has probably turned to dust, many of them, right? But they were not risen in their, in their glorified or their new body. So first begotten is really important. The terminology of your King James Bible is there for a reason. Why am I saying that? Because I'm going to use a few more words that would appear at the surface to be archaic or no good anymore. But they actually, what they do is they cut down into one word or condense an overall meaning. Instead of writing it out in long form, it shortens it using a bigger word or one that most people would say, oh, I don't know why we use these old words and this, that, and the other thing. But what I'm going to tell you today is they're in here for a reason. And it's important to know that Jesus is the first begotten of the dead. Now, that being said, chapter number two, verse number one, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Hey, listen, we need to be really careful, number one, handling the word of God. Number two, you need to give earnest heed or you need to really think about what you're hearing. It's really important, number one, for salvation. If you're saved, number two, for doctrine. If you're saved, number three, for how you should live your life. It's important that you know and you listen and that you're in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. It's very important because it's the Holy Spirit of God that speaks to you. How many of you hear an audible voice from heaven and it's God the Father every day talking to you? Nobody, right? I mean, I don't think so. God doesn't speak to us that way anymore. He uses his word. And since he's poured out the Holy Spirit on each one of us, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the word of God. Okay? So we need to really pay attention to what we're hearing. Lest at any time we should let them slip. Number one, you can let salvation slip right through your fingertips. If you hear the word of God, you need to act on the word of God. If someone gives the gospel, that person should accept Jesus Christ. Why? So it doesn't slip through their fingers, right? Well, how do you know that's what it means? Next verse. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Why? Because you let it slip through your fingers. Because when you heard it, you didn't hear it. You let it go right past you. Now, there's also more verses talking about how we should live, and we shouldn't let the word of God slip out of our hearts either or out of our hands. We should honestly work really hard every day to become the best Christian we can. We shouldn't settle for second best Christianity. We should always settle for being the best Christian every day that we can. Why? So we don't slip. Because when you slip, you fall, right? I mean, it's simple. You have nothing to hold on to if you're slipping around and you're sliding all over these false doctrines and you don't have anything to cling on to. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? See how important hearing is? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? Right? That's why we send missionaries out. You know, it's really important that a missionary knows where he's going as well. 
It's really important that a missionary really prays, seeks God's face on it, and realizes that that's the place where he's called. I'll tell you why. Because if he believes that there's someone out there that's searching through, as the Holy Ghost is knocking on their heart, then God needs to send that missionary to that place. But if it's a missionary or someone who wants to enter the ministry because they romanticize the thought of becoming a missionary or they really have a zeal for God and they just want to go out to some foreign field and they feel that's where God's leading them, they need to be real careful. Why? Because they're most likely going to slip and fall and leave the ministry. It happens all the time. Missionaries come back from the field and they never go back again. Why? Because they weren't listening to the Holy Spirit. They weren't listening to the Holy Spirit tell them where to go. They had in their mind, because they saw a missionary come to their church and they watched the video, that that's where God wanted them. Instead, it's important for them to get on their knees and not make a decision right away, but seek God's face and see where the Holy Spirit wants them to go. Because I guarantee you around the world today, there are people that the Holy Spirit's talking to and the Holy Spirit is saying, here's a little more light. I want you to get saved and I'm going to send you the right person. But if we get in the way and we're not listening to the Holy Spirit or the missionary is not, he's going to go off to Kalamazoo or somewhere like that. And that's not where God intended for him to go. So the Holy Spirit can be actually, he's, he's the greatest member of the Trinity for us right now because we can have the power of the Holy Spirit on our life. But he can also be very dangerous if we don't listen to him. Why? Because number one, we can neglect the salvation. Number two, we can neglect the will of God. And number three, we can neglect him on the power of our lives on what he wants us to do. <clears throat> turn, turn to the next page, please. Verse number four. Verse number four. Now, God also being with them, witnesses. Oh, I'm sorry. God also bearing them witnesses, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Number one, your gift is given to you by the will of God. His will for you, he gives you your gift. And you can't go to a Pentecostal church, jump in there and start speaking in, in weird tongues and jumping around, flopping on the floor, thinking that's God's will. That's not God's will. You know, God's will is, is he's not willing that any should perish. But how, if you're flopping around on the floor and making a bunch of noise, are you going to lead anybody to Jesus Christ? You're not. That's not a gift of God. That's a gift of the flesh. That's somebody in their flesh wanting some kind of power placed on them and they're flopping around acting silly and that's not the gift of God that he gives according to his will for your life. God has a will for each one of you. He'll give you a gift accordingly. He's already given you gifts. You just have to get in touch with him to find out what it is. That's, that's a really important thing, is the Holy Spirit also reveals to us our gifts. He reveals who we are. Now, verses 5 through 9, I'm not going to read them for the sake of time, but I am going to read verse 9. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. This is really, really important because if he has not tasted the death, that means he died and now he has risen because he tasted death so that we don't have to, right? These words are really important and maybe this is going to get a little deep here, but it's really important that we know in whom we've believed. That we know the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. And that we have the Holy Spirit of God ready at any time to get a hold of Him. Because we need Him. And, and we in America and around the world, we need the Holy Spirit of God big time today. More than America's ever needed the Holy Spirit of God other than maybe the Great Depression. America has needed and needs the Holy Spirit of God today. But we need to be real careful because there's a lot of other spirits running around as well, trying to compete with the Spirit of God. 
right? Trying to deceive people. See, this is a great opportunity for us as Christians, but it's also a great opportunity for the forces of evil and darkness. It's the demons are looking at this opportunity to break people down and destroy them. The demons are running around thinking about how they may bring down and collapse governments and how they may collapse people and financial institutions and all these things. Why? Because the devil wants to usher in his one world government. The devil wants to bring in his one world monetary system. The devil wants to bring in his one world religion, putting him at the top. That's what the devil wants. And he'll try to take advantage of every opportunity possible. But we as Christians with the Holy Spirit of God, we are that opposing force. That's why Jesus left us here, is to oppose the evil, to rebuke. The Bible says to rebuke them sharply that they may learn to fear. Sometimes you have to go out there and you just have to rebuke. Now, you shouldn't just go out there and start rebuking everybody you see. You should go out there and stand up and rebuke those that are fighting against good things, that are fighting against the goodness of God. The abortion crowd, the the pro-life crowd is the crowd we need to side with, not the the pro-death crowd. We need to side with pro-life and fight against the wicked murder and slaughter of innocent children. We need to be there fighting with the Holy Spirit of God, pushing back against that group. The group that thinks that I don't know, the A, B, C, D, L, B, G, T, Q, R, Z, X crowd, whatever they are. We need to be pushing against that. And many people say, well, we need to embrace them. No, we need to push against it. Push against it. That's what needs to be done. Now you can say, well, you don't sound very loving. Listen, I'm telling you right now, an entire city was destroyed in a minute. People died right away. You have to push against certain things. You have to push back evil. You have to. And you say, is it evil? It's evil. Evil at its core. Otherwise, God would have spared the city, right? God would have sent the angels in there like he sent Jonah. And God would have sent the angels with the Holy Spirit of God empowering them that they would have won the whole city to Jesus Christ, right? If it were possible, that would have happened. In Judges chapter number 19, in Judges 19... Instead of the man cutting up his concubine and sending her pieces of her body to the other uh, tribes of Israel, instead of that, what they should have done, right, because it was willing that, that God would save them all, is send evangelists, the Levites, the priests in, that they could win them all to Christ, right? But that's not what happened. They almost destroyed and annihilated the entire tribe of Benjamin, save one city. One city was all that was left. And the only reason why is because they said, look, we can't wipe them completely out, can we? Hey, listen. Listen, every time a king was elected, and he, or elected, I'm sorry, every time one, during the, through the line of David a king stepped in, the ones that did that, which was right in the sight of the Lord, kicked them out of the land. And a lot of times you'd say, that's not very loving. And, that, and this is where people say, well, that's the Old Testament then. That's just part of the Old Testament law and all this, that, and the other thing. And we don't do that anymore. Hey, look, America, see how liberated we are now? See how much better off we are now? Are we better off now? How much better off are we by saying, come on in, let's buddy up with you? I mean, are we really that much better off? Or are we worse off? And getting worse every day. Because see, when people tell me certain things about sodomites and abortion and all these different things, I have to make a hard stand. And I'll tell you right now, I can't find, and I've read the Bible multiple times, I can't find one place of a sodomite conversion. Not one place. Not one person. Not one time. Not one. Not one. Why? Because they harden their heart. They've rejected Jesus Christ. And if you read Romans chapter 1, you find, I don't care what cherry picking Bible verse you pull out of 1 Thessalonians or which one you pull out of uh, 1 Timothy and all these other verses that you'll pull out of context, out of Corinthians chapter 6. I don't care about as, as such were some of you. You don't understand what the Bible actually teaches. You can't use a vague verse to disregard chapters 
and chapters, not to mention things that are missing completely, like the salvation of one person in Sodom and Gomorrah. Not one. Lot couldn't save his family. His own wife turned back, which in my mind shows she wasn't even saved. Otherwise, she wouldn't have turned back. She'd have listened to God, and she'd have looked straight ahead and ran. Right? But she looks back. Why? Because her heart was there. Her heart was there. See? <clears throat> and that's what we need to be careful of today. We need to make stands with the Holy Spirit of God against certain things. We have to make a stand. Well, you hate people. No, you know what? I'm not a hateful person. And I'll tell you right now, I'll give everybody the gospel. I don't care who it is. Because I'm still going to try. Right? But there is a line, and that line gets crossed daily by people. I'll still do the best I can, live the best I can. But one thing I cannot do is I cannot sit by and let 1% of the population try to destroy this nation. I can't do it. I can't sit back there. Why? Because that 1% is destroying the next generation. See, I, I, this just comes to my head. When you read Genesis chapter 19, 18 and 19, I'm sorry, it's more 18. When, when Jesus, and it's Jesus because he's standing in front of Abraham, he's talking to Abraham and he says, the cry, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cry. Who cries? Who cries? Little kids being molested by a bunch of dogs, by a bunch of perverts. See, homosexual, it's not a gene. You're not born with a gay gene. Science has already proved that. Look, they're still trying to prove there is one, but even in the sets of twins, one's homosexual, one's not. Well, if they both have the same genes. Wouldn't they both be? No, really what it is is you reject the Holy Spirit of God long enough and God will give you up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meet. Even though God did not like to retain them in his knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Why? Uh, read Romans chapter 1. Show me, show me a more clear passage than that. And that's just Paul going back over uh, uh, the book of uh, Psalm I, it's either Psalm 78 79 or 82 he's just quoting the same exact thing over and over again the Bible just keeps talking over and over again the Holy Spirit of God why because the repetition is the key to learning God's repeating the same message over and over again no new message it's all the same message how do you know well let's begin that's a long introduction I'm sorry it's a 20 some minute introduction Let's skip down to chapter number 3, verse number 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus. Basically, Messiah Jesus. The Bible's calling him God by saying he's the anointed of God, the Messiah. He's Jesus. We know his name in the New Testament as Jesus. Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who had builded the house hath more honor than the house. What's he saying? Jesus is greater because Jesus created Moses. Because Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, and by him were all things created. So Jesus, what is Paul saying? He's saying Jesus Christ Jesus, God, is greater than your God, Moses. Because many of the Hebrews put Moses as their God. And Jesus even rebuked them, saying, you even sit in Moses' seat. And even when <clears throat> the rich man died and went to hell, and he saw uh, uh, Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, um, he was pleading with Abraham to send somebody back. And Abraham even said, look, even if I send somebody back from the dead, your brothers aren't going to believe. Right? They have Moses and the prophets. What is he saying? They have the Holy Spirit. They have the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's what he's saying. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, 
Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing in, of the hope firm unto the end? Look, our salvation is based upon who Jesus was. And we can have confidence in the hope of that, right? The Bible says it over and over again. If you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Why? For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who's the Lord? Jesus. The Bible doesn't say to call on Yahweh. The Bible doesn't say to call on Jehovah. It says to call, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Hey, you need to be careful with going back into these dead, dead languages. Because the Hebrew language had no vowels in it. It was all consonants. And here's the other thing. People quit actually speaking that language thousand years ago or more. No, about 3,000 years ago. So even the pronunciations have changed. Be very careful. That's why the Bible lays it cut, plain, simple, and dry, names, it, names him Jesus so that we all who speak English can understand, right? It, there's, no, there's no trickery involved, right? See, because see, when Abraham was around, he prayed to God Almighty, right? Because that's what he knew. And then in Psalms, it says, they prayed God Almighty because my name Jehovah was not given to them yet. Then it was Jehovah. And now going into the New Testament, it's now Jesus Christ because now he's revealed. Now the Son of God is revealed and his name is revealed. And that's why it's so important to know who Jesus actually is. Jesus is God. He's the Son of God. He's the number two part of the Trinity, but he's equal with God. He's not number two. He's still number one. They're all number one in my book. But they have an order of operation. God wants everything done decently and in order, right? So even he himself is in order, right? Because a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. That's what Jesus said. So everything is in its perfect order. God controls everything. Everything consists through God. He has everything in his hands. You think things are just falling apart and it's all by accident? No, God's let, God is doing it. He's doing it. You say, does God bring bad things upon people? Oh, I'd, I'd say you probably never read the Bible if you don't believe that one. Yeah, God will bring bad things for judgment to the Christian for your own good, that you get right serving him. For those who are unsaved and never going to get saved and have rejected him, it's for their destruction to get them out of our way. A lot of times God works like that. That's why King David could pray those impeccable prayers. Lord, do I not hate them that hate thee? I hate them with a perfect anger, uh, hatred. I count them my enemies that hate thee. Now, does that mean you run around hating everybody because they're not saved? No. But when somebody opposes God, like an Adolf Hitler, and he's slaughtering millions of people, you hate that person. You oppose them. You unite your forces. You go liberate those German people. And that's what we did. Because of what he was doing. Slaughtering millions of people. Millions. Right? I don't love that guy. That guy's a reprobate. He chose. You know what? If you sit here and say you love Adolf Hitler, something's wrong with you. Well... I just love him. Oh, you'd sacrifice yourself for him because that's what love is. You'd die for Adolf Hitler. Hey, hey, you love him so much? Would you go to hell where he's at today because you love him? Because that's what Jesus did. He paid for your debt. Would you pay for his debt? Jesus even said that there are those that are going to go to the lowest hell. I believe there's degrees in hell because I don't believe the little old lady who lived a good life, who died without Jesus is burning next to Adolf Hitler. I don't believe that for 10 seconds. I believe the Adolf Hitlers, the Mao Zedongs, the Pol Pots of Cambodia. I believe that the Joseph Stalins, I believe the Jeffrey Dahmers. I believe those guys like the Ted Bundys, the John Wayne Gacy's. I believe those reprobates are in the lowest hell getting what they deserve. Why? Because God's fair and just, right? Because Revelation 20 says, and the dead were judged and the books were opened. What's that mean? There, God's keeping a record. Thank God your record is wiped clean. Oh, it's wiped clean because Jesus' blood went. <clears throat> but their record is what they'll be judged by. 
Oh, they're going to hell for the rejection of Jesus Christ. But what they get, what, what destruction they receive for all eternity is based upon what's written in each one of their books. Because the books are opened and the dead are judged according to the works. See, you are not judged according to your works. Because if you were judged according to your works, we wouldn't make it. I wouldn't. Right? Thank God I'm not judged according to my works. I'm judged according to Jesus' finished work on the cross. But the good news about the finished work on the cross, it wasn't finished. He's still up there making intercession for us. His hands, the Father looks upon those hands and sees what was done for us. And he says, you know what? Your, their sins are forgiven. That work is still being done. Not the work of the sacrifice. That part's finished, right? Right? But the work of our forgiveness of sins, why? Because the Bible accounts of the devil as the accuser of the brethren. You think the devil's not up there right now in heaven hearing me teach a Sunday school lesson, looking at God the Father saying, he's a hypocrite. And he's in front of that church teaching a bunch of hypocrites how to live, what they should do. Teaching the word of God like he has any authority, like he has any purpose, like he has any power, like he's anybody important. But you know what? Jesus steps right in and says, no, Father, he does because he's doing what I want because I paid for him. He's been bought with a price. And that price was my death, burial, and resurrection. My blood is covering him, Father. You see it, right? And what's God the Father say? I see it. And the devil has to move on to the next guy he can accuse. Why? Because when God looks down, he sees the blood of his son covering me. Not my works. Because I don't have one good work that would do me any good in heaven. Not one. Not one. Verse number seven. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice. So, this is a really neat passage here because verse number seven says, the Holy Ghost speaks. And you can hear his voice. He's not, he's not some spirit, spooky spirit floating around. He's not some dove flapping his wings. That makes a great bumper sticker. But that's not the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he, he, was in the, he came down like a dove. What's that mean? You ever watch a dove land? They just come straight down. Doves, doves are usually harmless. You know, they're not a bird of prey. They just, when everything's clear, and God the Father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is being baptized. Everything's going the way it should be. The Holy Ghost just comes down like a dove. And that's the best way. The Holy Ghost isn't flapping his wings. He doesn't have any. But like a dove just comes down and rests peacefully and begins to feed. The dove, or the Holy Spirit, like a dove, comes down and rests upon Jesus Christ. See, as the Holy Ghost saith, he saith, right? So the Holy Ghost actually speaks because he's actually a person. And I can't explain the Holy Ghost in that way. It's really difficult. But I can tell you this, when you get to heaven, you'll be able to see him. You will. So there's some things that are going to be left out that we're not going to fully understand or be able to comprehend right now. But when you're completed in heaven, in your glorified body, you're going to see the Trinity. You're going to see the power. You know what the neat thing about this? When you die and go to heaven after the thousand year reign of Christ and everything's completed, you're actually going to get to watch Jesus Christ recreate the earth the way it was intended. The way he had it at the creation. Did you know that? That's what the Bible says. That the elements will burn with a fervent heat. When God reshapes and remakes this earth, you're going to be a witness to that. You're going to see the Holy Spirit of God move across the waters. You're going to see the God the Father standing there pleased with his son as he reshapes everything by the word of his power. You're going to see that. Isn't that going to be a neat treat to see? What are you going to do in heaven? Well, number one, I'm going to watch the creation again. That's going to be cool, right? I'm going to see God the Son and God the Holy Spirit work. And I'm going to stand by God the Father as it's being done. Man, what else would you want out of life? But, verse number 8, Harden not your hearts as in the day of the, pro as in the provocation and the day of the temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with them, with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. 
truth of the matter is, God's always talked to everybody throughout history. It's always been his plan that everybody gets saved. Not everybody's going to hear the Holy Spirit of God. Pastor is so giddy today. He must be filled with the Spirit. I can't wait to hear his sermon. <laughs> if, he's, if he's that happy, he better be preaching a good one, right? No, he usually does. We use the Bible, and that's the one thing. Um, we base everything up, upon the Word of God. And <clears throat> we just need to realize that through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will speak to us. And we can understand what God wants for us to do. And I believe that during this opportunity in America, there's a lot that we can do. And we need to take advantage of those things. We need to work really hard and take advantage of what the Holy Spirit has put in front of us. Because right now, with the way things are going and the way people have fear and different things, their hearts are ripe. The only problem is, who's getting them? Us or the devil? And we need to get in there. So that they don't reject the Holy Spirit when you do finally make your way there. Or when God finally makes his way there to give them the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for everything you've given us. Lord, you've given us so much we should be thankful continually. Lord, I know the best that we do falls short all the time. And Lord, I thank you for the mercy you've given us. Lord, I thank you for the opportunities you've given us and the forgiveness. Lord, I ask that you would touch the hearts of those, Lord, that are on the fence, that can't decide whether they want to accept you as their personal Savior. We all have a list. We all know people that are almost there. Lord, I ask that you keep that heart fresh, that they would be able to be receptive to your Holy Spirit when he does speak. Lord, I just ask that you be with our church, continue to bless and meet our needs, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.